Uh, good afternoon and welcome to What Matters to Me and Why here at UCI and via Zoom. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Kimberly Ayala, retired director of the Undergraduate Undeclared Advising Office in the Division of Undergraduate Education and a member of the organizing committee who has the honor of introducing our program today. First of all, apologies for any technical difficulties you may encounter today via Zoom as we navigate this hybrid format. We want to acknowledge the chancellor and the committee who make these presentations possible. What Matters to Me and Why started in 2012 and has now blossomed to include an alumni series and a medical school series. Be sure to check out these exciting opportunities on our website. This talk is being uh, recorded and will be available on our website soon. Next month on March 16th, Professor Andrew Penner will be our speaker and you can check out the details on our website. For those of you on Zoom, we invite you to keep your video on throughout the talk. You will be emailed an evaluation following the program and we really appreciate you taking the time to fill it out. We are eager to hear from you about ideas for future speakers for the series. For those of you attending your first event, we want you to know you're in for a unique experience. Speakers are asked simply and authentically to answer the question, what matters to you and why, and take it wherever it goes. The series provides a forum for speakers to talk about values, beliefs, motivations, and personal experiences they've encountered along the way. The hope is to strengthen bonds between the faculty, students, and staff who teach, learn, and work here, and celebrate both the diversity of this community and the commonalities that bind us together. At the end of the talk, there is ample time for questions and answers with the audience. We will soon hear from Jared Selnicker, who will introduce our speaker, Vice Provost Roxanne Cohen-Silver. What Matters to Me and Why has a tradition of taking a couple of minutes to allow you to turn to the person sitting next to you or close to you and introduce yourself and share with your neighbor where you work on campus. And for those of you on Zoom, you will be transported to a breakout room where you can introduce yourself and then we will return you to the larger group to start our presentation. So you can turn to your neighbor or a person closest to you to introduce yourself. And now we will hear from Jared, who will introduce our speaker today. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jared Salmaker, a sixth year PhD candidate in the Department of Psychological Science and a member of the What Matters to Me and Why Planning Committee. It is my honor to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Roxanne Cohen Silver is UCI's Vice Provost for Academic Planning and Institutional Research and a distinguished professor in the Departments of Psychological Science, Medicine, and Public Health. She has been actively involved in research, teaching, and administration at UCI since 1989, and she is an international expert in the field of stress and coping. It would take me the rest of the hour to list the numerous accomplishments and awards that Dr. Silver has earned over her remarkable career, but in the spirit of this series, I'd rather stay a little closer to the heart. Roxy is actually the person who recruited me to UCI when she was the uh, graduate advisor of the psychological science department. I remember pulling off the road and Roxy called me to let me know I made it into the program and hoping that she couldn't hear me holding back tears of excitement and relief. Roxy has told me that through her grad advisor role and through teaching the two core research methods courses in our program, she has known every single student that has come through the psychological science graduate program. It's rare for a professor to actually know that many students and it's even rarer for one to be as universally beloved as Roxy is to us. You might think that teaching the rigorous research methods courses can make you some enemies, but those classes are an honored rite of passage in our program. Though her courses were technically required, we had the privilege of Dr. Silver sharing her wisdom and stories with us. I'm excited that we all get to share in some of that experience today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Roxanne Cohen Silver. I'm really happy that Jared is not here in person because um, it, it's really very touching. So I have, been, when I was originally approached to speak in this series, I tried to avoid it as long as possible. 
I pleaded, too busy, pandemic, I don't want to wear a mask. And here I am, echoing in Crystal Cove Auditorium, speaking to over 400 empty seats and black boxes on Zoom. Why did I want to avoid this opportunity? Because it's extremely odd to speak about myself in this venue, among colleagues, peers, and friends. While I'm very used to giving talks, I have to admit that I'm rather uncomfortable talking about myself for this long of a period of time. I believe everyone has a story to tell. Everyone listening to this talk has navigated challenges, made choices, taken advantage of opportunities, and had supporters who helped them get to where they are today. My story is undoubtedly not unique, but in thinking about what I would say today, which I must admit I've been thinking about for several days, I've been struck by how much of who I am was shaped by very early experiences, certainly experiences that occurred several decades ago. Today I thought I'd talk about several topics. First, a bit about who I am and my background. Second, some stories about my first academic job and how it shaped my career trajectory. Third, a little about why I study the topics that I do and what I've learned in my research over the years. And finally, why I am committed to professional and university service and particularly in the arenas in which I choose to spend my time. So how do I introduce myself? I think my primary identity is in terms of the important roles I play in my social sphere. I am a mother, a daughter, a wife, a sister, a friend, a colleague, a mentor, and a teacher. And of course, I'm also a researcher and an administrator. Obviously, I wear many hats. I absolutely love my job. I cannot imagine a more wonderful career, spending my days talking to interesting people about interesting topics. And if forced to pick a single adjective to describe me, it's actually pretty easy. I think most people who know me would describe me as intense. But I'm also a person of many contradictions. I love to think and I hate to shop. I don't watch TV, but I love to follow the Chicago Cubs. I live in Laguna Beach, but I never go to the beach. I'm just as likely to be reading New York Times as gossip on TMZ.com. I love to clean, but I haven't cooked since 1987. <laughs> I appreciate new technologies, but I didn't give up my Blackberry until it died on New Year's Eve. <laughs> I never drank, smoked, or did drugs. In fact, the first and only time I ever went to a bar was at age 30 with some of my graduate students. Someone once asked me, what my vices were, and I have to admit that my vice and my passion is my work. In fact, I think the key to any professional success that I have had over the course of my career is because I work very hard. I was described by my graduate mentor in her letter of recommendation for my first job as having, quote, blood-curdling ambition. And I think that's what drives my focus, intensity, and passion. In fact, while I am absolutely certain that there are many people who work as hard as I do, I'm pretty confident that there are very few people who work harder than I do. I have extremely high standards. Some, perhaps my students, would say I'm a bit obsessive and I have as high expectations for myself as I have for others around me. In terms of achievements, I never give up. 
the last several dozen journal articles I have published have probably been rejected four or five times before they ended up in the journal that they did. I always shoot for the highest, most visible publication outlet. And when an article gets rejected, as one did on Sunday, I take about 45 seconds to regroup and decide where to send it next. Actually, when my students and I submit manuscripts for publication, we always have a plan B and C and usually D. So how did I end up this way? I come from a very traditional family of Russian Jewish immigrants. All four of my grandparents fled the pogroms in Eastern Europe around the turn of the 20th century. My grandmother, in particular, came from a very large family of eight sisters. Education was extremely important in our extended family, but only for males. In fact, men were supposed to be educated and women in my family were raised to be mothers and homemakers. When I was a little girl, my grandfather died, which set me into an existential crisis. I vividly remember asking my mother, what's the purpose of life if all you do is grow old and die? That was a very challenging question, but my mother had an answer that had worked very well for her and women of her generation. As I cried about the loss of my grandfather, my mom told me that the purpose of life was to get married and have children and pass the traditions and culture to the next generation who would see to it that life, one's life carried on through one's offspring. Her answer, while comforting to me at the time, ended up causing me a lot of conflict over the years. In fact, most of the answers that I received about the role of women in the family and in society felt somewhat off to me. Not wrong exactly, just incomplete. And my challenge to the roles of what I was supposed to be and the choices I made despite sharing the values instilled in me as a child led in most ways to who I am today. So I was apparently a very high achieving second grader. At one point, my parents were called into a meeting with the elementary school administrators. And one day, mid-year, I was, quote, promoted. That is, I literally moved my desk from the second to the third grade classroom. Although I couldn't read anything on the blackboard because it was written in cursive and I only knew how to print, I stayed focused and committed to success in my new classroom. But no one knew what to do with a high achieving girl in my family. My mother made me take typing and shorthand in high school with all the girls who smoked in the bathroom during breaks so I would have something to, quote, fall back on. I was the first girl in my extended family who went to college, let alone graduate school, and I always knew that I was considered the black sheep in our family. Of course, I didn't reject my family values and background completely. I was very active in a sorority in college, my boyfriend was in a fraternity, and I got married, like all my sorority sisters, by the end of my senior year, at 20 years old, just like my mother. But I was different. I didn't want to live my mother's life. I was passionate about psychology, and I started graduate school at Northwestern University a few months after my marriage. And I finished graduate school at age 25. And when I got my PhD, my grandmother said, okay, enough of this education. When are you gonna have a baby? 
and it turns out not for a very, very long time. I was fortunate to get a faculty position right out of graduate school. In fact, in those days, there were not many academic jobs, and I was the first person in the country to get an assistant professor position in social psychology in January of my fifth year in graduate school. I was offered an extremely attractive position at the University of Waterloo in a powerhouse psychology department in Ontario, Canada, one of the best jobs the year I came out from graduate school. But my husband was still in medical school, and he wasn't going to be able to leave Chicago for at least a year. This was 1981, and we were going to embark on a commuter marriage, a radical, unusual, and certainly non-traditional path. When I told my mother, she begged me not to tell my father. In fact, I kept the news from my father for over six months, until two weeks before I was moving to another country. And when my husband and I met with my father to tell him, my dad was absolutely horrified. And he said to my husband, you will create a monster. You should never let her go. And then my father turned to me and he said, Roxy, have you thought about how Ron will come home at night after a long day at work and there will be no food in the refrigerator, no dinner on the table, no clean clothes in the drawer. Roxy, have you thought about that? And I responded, Dad, Ron comes home now at night and there's no food in the refrigerator <laughs> and there's no food on the table and there, were, there are no clean clothes because of course I was a graduate student. Although my husband and I were only going to commute for a year, it turns out that he hated living outside the U.S. almost from the minute he set foot on Canadian soil. And ultimately, we commuted for the next six years. Well, actually, I commuted. Back and forth for six years from Waterloo to Chicago, I flew from Toronto every Friday evening and from Chicago every Tuesday morning because it was my role to do so. That is, I worked as an academic during the week and I was a homemaker on the weekend. Thus, despite the importance of my career, I was also raised with the very explicit message that if a husband's shirt was not ironed, or his shoes weren't polished, it was a bad reflection on his wife. So I must admit it's true, in addition to doing my husband's laundry every Saturday, I also polished his shoes when I was home for the weekend from Waterloo. So how about my job? How did I as a young, how did I fare as a young academic given these circumstances? Well, to be completely honest, it was a bit challenging. The Department of Psychology at the University of Waterloo in the early 1980s was not much different from academic departments across Canada at that time. I was told that Canada was a few decades behind the US, and at that time in the early 80s, only 10% of tenured faculty across Canada were women. In fact, when I joined the Department of Psychology, it had a faculty of 42, 40 men and two females, both of whom were married to members of the department. And they knew they wanted to change that. I later learned that the men in the department decided that they wanted a gutsy female and I fit the bill. But they didn't know how to work with a young woman. The last person hired before me was now a full professor, 15 years older than me. 
So let me tell you some stories about how all the things played out. My colleagues prided themselves on never having a faculty meeting. But all the decisions were made on Friday afternoons in the men's locker room after the weekly department hockey game. And when I offered suggestions, their responses were patronizing. I was thanked for my contributions and completely ignored. As an assistant professor, one of my colleagues called me with a request. You see, we were hosting a famous psychologist in our department in a week. Here's how the phone call went. Roxy, you know that Sally and I have recently split up. And you know that Dr. Smith is visiting and I'm hosting a party for him on Friday. Would you please come over and clean my house? Although I was one of the only Jews in the department, I was regularly asked to organize the department Christmas party. My colleagues planned out the course curriculum on the blackboard, and the names were listed as follows from top to bottom. Lerner, Ross, Holmes, Zana, Roxy. And I said, guys, take a look at that list. What's wrong with that picture? And my colleague said, oh, I'm sorry. And he went over to the board. He crossed off my name at the bottom of the list and put Roxy at the top. And finally, when I decided to leave, an announcement was sent out to the department. The chair's message read, we are sad to announce that Roxy has decided to leave the department. She will be replaced by Dr. Jeff Fong. And I said, guys, what's wrong with that message? And they said, oh, you are right, Roxy. You can never be replaced. When I tell these stories to my young female colleagues now, they find some of them very hard to believe. But this is what social psychology calls non-conscious ideology, a bias that is so invasive, so ingrained, that it goes completely unnoticed by the perpetrators. My colleagues were a group of liberal men who prided themselves on their open-mindedness and progressiveness in hiring a young woman. But they did not know how to work with one, something that sadly, decades later, still goes on in some units across our country and academia. But I did not want to fight this battle forever. It was exhausting and not productive academically. And I was drawn at the time to the then program in social ecology, an interdisciplinary unit at UCI, which had an opening for an assistant professor in psychology in the late 1980s. And when I interviewed, the first thing I noticed, in addition to the sun and the palm trees in January, was that the unit that I was interviewing at was one-third female. This was a breath, breath of fresh air. I could not wait to join a department that shared my values to use the scientific method to study societal problems, but to do so among other women was so invigorating and very exciting. I was absolutely thrilled to get the job offer. And after I did and I hung up the phone, I thought about it for, I think, maybe eight to 10 minutes. And then I called Dan Stokels, the director of social ecology, and I said, at the risk of sounding too eager, I accept your offer. No negotiating, nothing. I just took the position because this was a dream come true. I've been at UCI since the late 80s, and over the past several decades, I have always felt supported by my colleagues. I was given freedom and encouragement to pursue my passions. My suggestions were embraced, 
and while here, my career has thrived. For the past several decades, I have studied how individuals cope with tragedies, with sudden, random, uncontrollable, and unpredictable events, like loss, physical disability, childhood sexual abuse, school shootings, terrorist attacks, earthquakes, firestorms, pandemics. And I am typically asked, why do I study such topics? Was it driven by personal experience or personal loss? Well, I would say there are two reasons why I study these issues. First, I lived the first 18 years of my life in Skokie, Illinois, at the time a predominantly Jewish community that was the home to the largest number of concentration camp survivors outside of Israel. The community was filled with a group of individuals who experienced unspeakable tragedy. And yet they built a vibrant community with strong values, supports, and material success. The Holocaust captured my attention. I read books about it, watched films about it, and tried to wrap my head around it as a young person. The second reason I study what I do is that my best friend's father suddenly and unexpectedly got an aggressive brain tumor while we were in high school. And from the time that he learned of his illness in his early 40s until he was dead was three weeks. And I didn't know what to say to help my best friend. And I wanted to understand how to assist friends and loved ones as they went through adversity. And this has been the focus of my work for over 40 years. Since graduate school, I have again challenged the status quo. I have questioned clinical lore that describes how people were supposed to cope with tragedy. In my studies, I have come to identify what I have called the myths of coping. For example, my work has determined that it is a myth to assume that psychological responses are predictable. That is, it is a myth that there are universal reactions to traumatic events. In fact, my research indicates that there is no one universal response to tragedy. My work has demonstrated that it is a myth to assume that emotional responses to traumatic events will follow a pattern or that people will go through an orderly sequence of stages in response to a negative event. My work says, suggests that it is a myth to assume that emotional responses to traumatic events are controllable and that individuals could pull themselves together if they just tried harder to do so. And although the typical bereavement leave in the United States in most companies is about three days, my work suggests that it is a myth to assume that individuals soon recover from traumatic life events. And driven by the experience with my high school friend, my work has also explored what is the best way to help individuals who are going through tragedy. I have identified what my colleagues and I call well-intentioned but misguided support attempts. Here are some unhelpful responses to individuals who have experienced a negative life event. Giving advice. Unless one has special needed expertise, giving advice is one of the least preferred ways to receive social support. Minimizing the trauma. Oh, it's not so bad, it would have been worse. Forced cheerfulness. Time to go to a party. Encouraging quick recovery. Boy, it's been three months already. Shouldn't you start dating? Often said to widows. 
identification with feelings. I know how you feel. Unless somebody has experienced a very similar trauma, this is a very alienating response. Providing a philosophical or religious perspective on the trauma, it was God's will. People who are religious find such comments to be completely unnecessary, and people who are not religious find such comments to be very alienating. Over-controlling behavior, making your problem their problem, and you're going to fix it. So what should we do? What are helpful responses to individuals who have experienced a negative life event? One of the most important things is providing the opportunity to ventilate and to share feelings. Expressing concern, saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to hear your news, is always seen as helpful. Provide tangible support, give a person a ride, loan money, make dinner. Presence, just being there. In one of my studies was the number one recommendation for what to do for somebody who was experiencing a tragedy. And for some people, providing contact with similar others. I would also like to stress that despite the critical role of my research in my day-to-day -day life, since graduate school, I have primarily seen myself as a teacher. And I think that's why Jared's comments hit me so uh, dramatically. Of undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs in the community at large, my identity is as a teacher. I have been very gratified to get emails many years later from former students thanking me for a tidbit they learned in one of their classes that resonates in their current lives. In fact, my public identity as an educator is extremely important to me. Moreover, mentoring of undergraduates, graduate students, and junior colleagues plays a very important role in my professional activities. I know firsthand the importance of having a strong mentor in graduate school, but I also know how incredibly detrimental it was to my early career not to have colleagues who knew how to facilitate my success. And I have taken the mentoring role very seriously. As Jared said, I served as the director of the doctoral program in the Department of Psychological Science on two occasions for about nine years since I've been at UCI. It's important to me to both encourage young people to see how they can thrive in academia and help them achieve goals that neither they nor their families saw were possible. I've also embraced opportunities to speak to community groups about my research, and I do so regularly. And I've been willing to speak to reporters. While there is often the possibility, there's always the possibility that I will be misquoted, I have felt over the years that if someone knowledgeable did not share the science, there would always be someone out there less knowledgeable who would be more than willing to seek out the media. In addition, I've had the great opportunity to bring, bring my work to the highest level of government, both in the US and abroad. After the September 11th terrorist attacks, I was honored to serve as an advisor to the US Department of Homeland Security traveling to and from Washington, D.C., sometimes several times a month for about 10 years. I've also been interested in speaking to politicians and policymakers in the U.S. and abroad about the importance of using scientific evidence in forging policy, rather than relying on anecdotes or hunches to guide decision-making. 
and I recently completed a two-year stint as the president of the Federation of Societies in Behavioral and Brain Sciences, FABS, a consortium of 27 professional societies and over 60 academic departments who advocates for the important role of the social and behavioral sciences to funding agencies, policymakers, and the public at large. And because I grew up among concentration camp survivors who scooped out coleslaw in the deli with a number tattooed to their forearm, I have always been drawn to the plight of the underrepresented minority or the outsider. Since I was young, I was concerned with social justice and have been motivated to challenge stereotypes, encourage diversity, and facilitate inclusiveness. And for this reason, I was excited to spend almost six years in UCI's Office of Inclusive Excellence, where I oversaw the Decade Mentor Program and the UC President's Postdoctoral Fellows Program, working with units on our campus to bring in more diverse graduate students, postdocs, and faculty, and to facilitate success for women and underrepresented minorities throughout academia. And because of my commitment to always trying to better the environment in which I work, I was happy to accept Provost Hal Stern's request that I spend the next stage of my career at UCI as Vice Provost for Academic Planning and Institutional Research, a position I assumed about four and a half months ago. Finally, I started my comments today talking about my identity as a wife and a mother. And I thought I would share a few tidbits about the importance of my family in providing a foundation upon which I can spend my time doing what's important to me. As you might have surmised, the marriage that I began at age 20 ultimately did not last the challenges of distance and social and family pressures to be a more traditional couple. After 10 years of marriage, my first husband and I were divorced. Admittedly, it took a while for me to find a spouse who could support and encourage a career path and that I wanted to be on and the ambition that I had to make up for lost time after my first marriage ended. Happily, I found that person in the halls of UCI. I met a man who took a position on our campus through UCI's temp services when his company was struggling in the early 90s and he, decided, and he needed to make some money to support his daughter from his first marriage. And consistent with my newfound freedom to challenge the status quo, it turns out that this man's background could not have been more different from mine. It was actually as different as possible. I was a second generation Jewish immigrant from Russia. He was a Muslim immigrant from the Middle East. And together, we both thought we could demonstrate tolerance and embrace diversity in our own home. And that was over 30 years ago. And although my mother told me as an adolescent that life's purpose was to pass my culture to the next generation, I did not give birth until I was 40 years old. And it was a very difficult pregnancy. I was in bed for six and a half months before laptops and smartphones, and I developed gestational diabetes and ended up having two surgeries. And every Sunday, I would feel sorry for myself, cry for a few minutes, and decide that I would die with a few less publications. But after my son was born, amazingly delivered at full term, I was determined to take the passion and intensity that I focused on my work and try to be the best mother I could be. 
And my son had a very different upbringing than I did. In our house, his father cooked. In fact, once when my husband was out of town, my son bemoaned the fact that he really wanted an omelet for breakfast. When I said maybe I would make it for him, he asked incredulously, you know how? <laughs> and then after staying with my homemaker sister for a week while I was giving a talk at a conference in Europe, my son cried un unconsolably when we left her house. And when I asked why, he said, Aunt Denny bakes cookies. Why can't you bake cookies? And once, while we were out shopping for school supplies, my young son pointed a at a picture on the wall in Target on Barranca of a mom with a little boy on her back at the playground. And my son said, you're not that kind of mom. And then it took him a while as I tried to get him to explain through the tears. And he said, you know, an outdoors mom. True, my son was raised with his mom spending her days and nights at the computer. But I was also the room mom for both him and my stepdaughter. Indeed, my stepdaughter, who is now a very successful, confident businesswoman who watched me sit in front of a computer writing lectures, grants, and papers, ended up supporting her boyfriend as he completed his PhD in neuroscience. And when they got married, she explained to him that she well understood the aspirations and goals that he had because her stepmom, quote, did the same thing. And my son, who was a year-round youth athlete who played baseball and soccer and football, had a mother who never missed one of his games when I was in town. And he was secretly proud, as he later admitted, when I gave a lecture to his elementary school class on psychological research. And once he got to college, he was openly proud, as he admitted to me, to tell his professors that his mom, too, was a university professor. Indeed, he is now on the same course as he pursues graduate school in bioengineering, hoping one day to become a professor. And he has learned that while passing one's culture to the next generation is important, it can happen in lots of other avenues beyond just having offspring. And even my mother and father subsequently apologized to me for not acknowledging that there are different paths to life's success than the ones that they expected of me when I was young. In fact, as they both developed memory issues, they conveniently forgot the messages they taught me decades ago that limited women to a single role. Because my parents, like my children, came to recognize that women can thrive in whatever arena they choose to enter, that opportunities are limitless if they are unwilling to accept the status quo, unwilling to accept when, what someone says is, just, is right just because the person says it's true, and if they are willing to stay laser focused and work hard to achieve their goals. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was a wild presentation. Just for a, 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 an offbeat question, what do you do in your spare time? <laughs> do you want the socially desirable answer no. or the truth? Uh, I work, uh, but I wouldn't call it spare time. I, I love what I do, and so I, 
like to work. I mean, I do watch the Cubs and I do read TMZ and I read New York Times, but, but basically I really enjoy what I do and it doesn't feel to me like a chore, I have to be honest. So Roxy, uh, to say the least, we obviously love working with you at OIE and in your new role. As, but I wanna ask a question related to your research because it's so impactful now. Uh, to kind of remember that we've all been through traumas of sorts through COVID and, and we really struggle, but we're also struggling as we're trying to see how some of your research is being integrated into coping strategies that we can work with students and at our institutions uh, to create better community and um, just more care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a sense um, in terms of, because I know you've done work internationally looking at post-traumatic stress and mm -hmm. other areas, but do you have a, a, a sense yet of how some of these um, strategies are being integrated into colleges and universities for practice, or would you recommend? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Marguerite. I think one of the issues is that my research tells me that there is not a one-size-fits-all response. And I think that if people assume that everybody is supposed to respond in one way, they don't have the empathy or the, they may not demonstrate the empathy or the compassion for people who are really struggling. And I, it is really controversial in the psychological community right now whether COVID-19 is a trauma. To me, it's, that seems, nutty because I think it is a collective trauma unlike anything certainly we've known in, during my lifetime. But there has been a widely different level of exposure of challenges, certainly underrepresented minority families, people with very uh, limited internet, people who have had, had to care give younger or older individuals who were immunocompromised, it has been very, very challenging for many people, but not everyone. Certainly some people have made millions of dollars during this time as the stock market has gone up. So there's just enormous variability. I think the most important thing and things that I have said when I've had the opportunity to do so is the importance of having compassion for our friends, colleagues, students, peers. I think it's very, very important that we don't judge how people are coping, that we don't impose our coping strategies on them, and that we recognize that this has been a very, very difficult time. That's the best I can say. I mean, I think that there has been it, it, right even before the pandemic, a recognition of mental health challenges for students, graduate students across the United States and maybe in, Nor and in North America. So we were time to, to think about this. this is not, I'm not advocating coddling people. I'm just advocating compassion, recognition that this has been challenging. And that most people who are really struggling probably have a story that they haven't shared with you. And that has been, and, and sort of understanding that has really helped me in my interactions with other people. And now we have a question from a Zoom member, from Val Janice. Oh, hey Val. Hey Roxy. <laughs> wow, I'm, just, I'm mostly just testing the technology. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, fabulous, fabulous talk, as those of us that know you knew it would be. I just, I just want to say thank you. Sincerely. And of course, I want to make a comment and get your answer. Okay. You know, early in your talk, and I thought this was kind of a theme running through it, you said, and I'm quoting, I think I got the quote right, my vice and my passion is my work. And I think that came out very clearly. Now, you know, I'm a criminologist, and I hear the word vice, and I think of criminal activity, but I knew that's <laughs> not what you meant, so I looked it up while you were talking. And the first definition of vice is immoral, wicked behavior. And I'm sensing that's not what you meant either. So why is your work a vice? It what? sounds to me like you love it, you're outrageously successful, you smile when you talk about it. Why is it a vice? 
Well, no, it's just that I, I think I was saying that I was always asked, you know, you don't, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't do drugs. What, you know, what do you do? I mean, your first question was, what do you do in your spare time? And so I, I, I think people who meet me for the first time, they think there's, there's got to be really something that she's, you know, that she's doing. I, 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 I guess, Val, as you know, I do work all the time. And I do enjoy it. And I have to say, uh, you know, it doesn't, I guess it doesn't feel that much like work. I, I want to take one comment, which I, I met with uh, w when my current husband and I first met. We went out to dinner with a good friend of mine who was a professor at, at UC Berkeley. And she turned to him and she said, you know, how in the world do you cope with Roxy being such a workaholic? And he said, you know, for me, work, play, it just sort of intermingles. And she goes, oh my God, they, they found one another. So, you know, it is true that you really do need to be with somebody who supports that kind of intensity and um, passion towards one's work because it could have been very difficult had that not been the case. Okay, our last question here. First of all, thank you for your talk. And it's so nice to learn about you. I've heard about you for so many years. Um, I'm curious, there's so much conversation around work-life balance in our world. And I think that that's an important uh, conversation to have. From your perspective, how do you um, sort of put your arms around that? So Kim, we should have, ended that, the, the set of questions before the, uh, I, you know, um, I think for people who don't, who feel no control over their work, who feel that they really would rather be doing something else, it's extremely oppressive to ha have to work all the time. Again, I think that that's sort of not how I feel, so my work-life balance is, that I work and it's my life and I enjoy it. Um, but I think for, for many people, the, the challenge is that they have somebody, let's say a coworker or a supervisor who, is, um, who doesn't treat them well or who makes them feel like they uh, are not valued or who um, control, you know, makes people feel like they don't have control over their lives and for them, work is not a joy and for them they really need to break away and so i think you know it all depends on personal values i will say i i'm watching my son now who just advanced to candidacy at the excitement that he's having on some of his new research he calls me regularly to share with me the research that he's doing and how you know i i hear this passion and excitement in his voice and he's working all the time. And he's one who used to say to me, I will never be like you. I will never sit at a computer all the time. And so I think when you really enjoy what you're doing and have intellectual and emotional excitement from that, it doesn't feel like a chore. That's all Okay, I can, can we thank Roxanne one more time? <laughs> thank you so much, Kim. And I wanna thank you all for coming. Um, this is kind of exciting to have this hybrid, but have a great day. <laughs>